Thank you all for, for being here. I'm happy to be able to do this webinar, even if it's early now in Brazil, it's six in the morning, so uh, I'm waking up now, but uh, happy to, to talk about this morning uh, about market design, uh, market design for uh, gas and power industry. So let's get started. Let me begin by uh, considering a, a, a simple t situation to give you uh, the basic intuition uh, behind uh, the problems we are dealing with today. Consider two points, two distant points. One of them has, a, for example, a gas production field. The other one is uh, an electricity consumption field, uh, point. Sorry. So uh, the basic idea is that we need to choose between two possible options. The first one is building a gas fire power plant beside the gas production field and then using a power line to transport electricity through the, through the electricity consumption point. The other option would be to build the gas fire power plant beside the electricity consumption point and using a typically a gas pipeline for transporting uh, gas from the gas production field to the gas fiber plant. So uh, choosing between these two options is pretty much a problem. So probably the first question uh, that arises here is, uh, uh, is this a regulatory problem? It seems that the markets are supposed to do this. So uh, I want to have your opinion here and for that, I'm launching a, a poll, a simple yes or no thing. Uh, is the interaction a regulatory issue? So please answer. I'm going to give you some time. This is a very simple question to read. Maybe not so easy to answer, but easy to read. I see that you're still voting. And uh, I'm closing the poll now to uh, share with you the results. And uh, most of you say yes, uh, some of you say no. I have to say that uh, I am with a yes because if it is no, uh, it would be uh, uh, the shortest webinar of all time. Uh, but now I'm going to to need to prove you, to you that this is a regulatory issue. And this is a regulatory issue because in this simple example, uh, we forgot to tell that some of the decisions concerning the, the choice are not taken by markets. Uh, we don't have a simple power line. What we have is a complex system of uh, power lines interconnected among them with uh, complex technical characteristics, uh, which in turn make the uh, market arrangement significantly difficult. Uh, analogously, we don't have a simple pipeline. What we have is a complex system of pipelines uh, and other elements. Uh, we have a gas network. Uh, so in both situations, uh, we will be taking decisions outside the market. This shouldn't be surprising because nobody is expecting uh, to uh, coordinate uh, a power system uh, using exclusively decentralization. Uh, there are a need, uh, certain need for uh, centralization in the power system, and the decisions taken during that process uh, are taken outside the market that are indeed affecting this choice. I need a footnote here. Uh, uh, I need you to note that uh, I said here that we don't have pipelines, we have gas networks. If you go to the US and you say uh, exactly the same sentence, they are going to call you crazy, to say the least. So it's important to have in mind that uh, what I'm talking about today uh, is uh, mainly applied to European Union system. Probably not exactly or uh, cannot be translated directly to U.S. gas systems. But uh, 
Okay, the bottom line here is that we have networks. Networks imply that we are taking decisions outside markets, and these decisions are essentially made up of simplifications of the of the power of the power and gas systems in order to facilitate traded arrangements. The next question probably then is that uh, uh, this simplification requires to be the same in both networks, put it differently. Does it mean that both market designs must be the same? I want your answers also here, so I'm launching again a poll. Again, it's yes or no. Simply, does it mean that market designs uh, need to be the same in both markets? I'm seeing you voting. You're still voting, so some more seconds, and I am closing now to share with you the results. Well, okay, this is a, a majority for now, and in fact, to be honest, I I have to say that I can see a logic for uh, both of the answers, both for the yes and for the no. This is a significantly difficult question to answer. And in fact, most of the webinar today is about giving the frame and giving some discussion to this question. Uh, what are the criteria we need to have in mind to decide uh, whether this market design should be the same or not? To do so, I'm going to follow uh, this agenda. I'm going to begin by showing the interaction between market design. And uh, this interaction, this, the, the basic problem uh, involved in this interaction will be uh, situations where uh, the simplification process uh, of the network in what market for example, in the power market, is affecting the results in the gas market. Uh, that is, uh, I need to simplify the power, the power network in order to facilitate uh, trading arrangements in the power sector, but this simplification of the power network, for example, is affecting the, the gas market. And it is affecting the gas market, uh, in particular, uh, concerning the incentives that are faced by market participants. The idea is that the network simplification in one market, say gas, is affecting the incentives uh, observed by the participants in the other market. And consequently, is affecting the decision-making process of these market participants. These two points are based on the idea that market design uh, consists largely on simplifying network characteristics. Close the argument, then I will need to discuss uh, whether this is true. So, I am going to, to end the webinar by analyzing uh, the criteria behind network simplification in order to show that simplification is a sound design strategy and um, uh, in, powers, in power and gas se sectors, uh, simplification of networks is almost inescapable. So uh, let me summarize the starting point. Let me summarize the elements I will need for uh, the following. And uh, the starting point is that I'm assuming that implementing market means simplifying network characteristics. And uh, this simplification of network characteristics from the point of view of market participants is equivalent to uh, giving free flexibility to market participants. From the point of view of markets, simplifying network characteristics is equivalent to receiving free flexibility. This free flexibility is uh, uh, a useful tool in implementing market because it makes the product more homogeneous. It makes uh, uh, the amount of traders uh, trading with the same product uh, higher. Uh, that's increasing liquidity, that's increasing the uh, efficiency of the market. So the idea is that uh, 
Implementing markets will imply simplifying network characteristics, and simplifying network characteristics will imply uh, giving free flexibility. And this free flexibility has two main dimensions. The first one is time. For example, when you set the same price for using the network, either power or gas, uh, uh, using the network with volatility and uh, using the network with flat patterns has the same price. And uh, the other dimension is space. For example, when long distance trades have the same price as short distance trades. So uh, implementing markets is simplifying networks. Simplifying networks is giving flexibility, which has two main dimensions, time and space. With all these points, we are looking at the consequences uh, of these decisions in the uh, interaction of markets. To do so, I am going to, to begin by considering this situation. We have two zones. In the, in the first zone, the zone, excuse me, in the zone A, we have a significant amount of wind power, which means that we have a power generation with intermittency. And in zone B, we have the opposite situation. We have a flat power production and consumption. So in zone A, the existence of, of significant amounts of wind power means that the power prices will be volatile. And the volatility of power prices will be an incentive uh, for investment in gas turbines in zone A. Uh, on the contrary, in zone B, we will have flat power prices because uh, production and consumption is flat. And these flat power prices uh, don't give enough volatility to uh, be a signal for investment in gas turbines. So in the end, what we have um, uh, in these two zones is an investment signal for gas turbines in zone A. But this is uh, looking just at the power system. What happens from the gas system point of view? The existence of uh, a lot of gas turbines, uh, because of the incentive in, in zone A, creates a volatile gas consumption in zone A. This volatile gas consumption creates a, a need for flexibility that makes the gas expensive. And this expensive gas is a counter signal for investment in gas turbines. On the contrary, in the gas system in zone B, we have a flat gas consumption. So we don't have a need for flexibility. So our gas will be cheap. So we will have an investment signal because of the cheap gas in zone B. So at the end of the day, what we have is the opposite, uh, the opposite incentive coming from the gas system. We have a, uh, an, uh, an incentive for the investment in gas turbines uh, in zone B if we look at the gas system. So we have a trade-off. We have a signal from the power system uh, invest in, in zone A. Uh, uh, we have a signal in the gas system invest in zone B. This is nice. This is what markets are supposed to do. Uh, market participants uh, will compare the two signals uh, we decide, uh, and they will decide uh, whether to invest in zone A or zone B. The problem is that market rules are affecting this trade off. Uh, and they are, and, and market rules are affecting this trade off because uh, prices are not only uh, market decisions, but are affected by the decision taken in the simplification process. Uh, let me ask you a question to uh, make a link with uh, real application. Which of the two options uh, is an example of free flexibility? Uh, I'm going to launch a poll to ask you about this. The two options are uh, A, daily balancing mechanism. This means that uh, the gas has the same price within the day. And uh, the second option is selling underground storage in a certain option. Uh, you have to choose uh, which of the two 
is a, an example of free time flexibility. I think that you are voting still, giving you some more seconds. And I am closing the poll now and sharing with you the results. Majority for daily balancing. And this is the right answer. Uh, what we mean by free time flexibility is that uh, all the allocation is done uh, outside the market, is not priced in the market. If we are selling underground storage uh, uh, by means of auctions, it's true that we are allocating time flexibility to market participants, but market participants are paying uh, for the underground storage and they are paying uh, uh, according to their preferences. So uh, the answer is A. And going back to, to, the, to the example, what we are, uh, the problem we are dealing with is that uh, the trade-off between investing in zone A and investing in zone B is affected by microbrews. And it's affected by uh, the definition of this free time flexibility. For example, consider that in order to increase liquidity in the process of designing the market, we decided that shorter flexibility is socialized, is free, and we also decided that, sorry, uh, network tariffs uh, don't reflect flexibility cost. This means that the signals from the gas system uh, are weakened. And they are weakened so that uh, can be even hidden uh, from the market point of view. Consider, for example, uh, the free flexibility we were talking about, the daily gas balancing, and in a particular situation where the daily gas balancing offers enough temporal flexibility to destroy the localization signal. What we have then is that uh, because we, decide, we define it a uh, level of temporal flexibility high enough, we are uh, solving the trade-off only looking at the power system. And this can be efficient, or um, this may be efficient in some situations, but may be inefficient in some other situations. So, uh, so much for time flexibility. Let's look at the other dimension, spatial flexibility. To show you the interaction, uh, let me consider again the two zones, zone A and zone B. And uh, in this case, we have a congestion in the power line connected both zones. This congestion means that we have a high power price in zone A, either short term or long term price, and a, a low power price in zone B. Uh, this situation means that the high power price is an incentive for the investment in gas turbines. The low power price is a counter signal, so uh, we will have uh, looking just uh, at the signals from the power system, an incentive for the investment in gas turbines in zone A, which is exactly what we need. We need the signals for investment in gas turbines in order to remove the congestion in the power net. But what happens if we look uh, if we look at the gas system? We may have a situation where uh, we have a contractual congestion. Contractual congestion is a situation coming from the idea of giving free spatial flexibility, and it's a situation where uh, the capacity that can be sold by market because of the simplification process is lower than the physical capacity of the network. This means that the congestion of the network is not a physical congestion, it's just a con congestion caused by the simplification of the network. This contractual congestion uh, is equivalent to consider or can be understood as uh, an artificial high gas price in zone A, for example, and artif artificial low gas price in zone B. This means, excuse me, this means that uh, the artificial high gas price will be a counter signal for investment in zone A, and the low gas price will be uh, an incentive for investment in gas turbines in in zone B. So what we have in the end is an, uh, again 
an investment uh, coming from the gas system to invest in gas, in gas turbines in zone B. So again, we have a trade-off. We have uh, exactly the same trade-off as before. The problem is that now this trade-off is not based on market players' preferences. It's a trade-off created by uh, decisions taken in the market design process, or in the process of designing the market. Uh, again, to link this free spatial fle flexibility in some real life example, I want to ask you uh, uh, which is free spatial flexibility of these two options. I'm going to launch another poll. Last one today, I promise. So uh, again, you you have to choose between these two options. The single node pricing in power networks is a pricing system with where all uh, consumption and production points in the network have the same price. Market splitting in power networks is uh, an algorithm uh, in order to calculate uh, different prices depending on where the congestion in the power network is. I am going to give you a couple of more seconds. And I'm closing the poll now to share with you the results. And we see a majority for market split. Uh, well, the answer is that uh, single node pricing is the free spatial flexibility we are considering. The idea is that uh, single node pricing uh, creates a zone where all injection and withdrawals from the power network are the same. You have only one price for all the, for all the um, zone. So uh, all the differences in cost uh, among different points are socialized so, uh, and are managed by the system operator. So in fact, uh, the spatial flexibility is given for free. Market splitting is an algorithm to calculate different prices. So uh, at the end of the day is uh, the equivalent or the analog at the, uh, to the underground storage situation we were considering before. So the, uh, the idea here is that it's not about uh, schemes with spatial flexibility. The idea is that the spatial flexibility needs to be free because if it's allocated according to market preferences and players are paying for that, there are no interactions uh, between market designs. So, I'm going to hide the last poll and continue with this. Considering uh, the, the situation we had before, for example, uh, we have a gas system with an entry exit capacity allocation system that offers enough spatial flexibility to destroy the localization signal coming from the power system. This means that uh, this uh, price differences, which is artificial, uh, are strong enough to be higher than the uh, signals coming from the power system. So we are deciding on the investment of gas turbines according to an artificial signal, according to a signal uh, defined by regulation, hiding the signals that were coming from the, from the market, from the power market. So, uh, so far we have looked at the consequences of the market design, of the simplification process. We have uh, assumed that simplifying the network is at the core of market design. Uh, and the consequences of that are uh, distorted signals uh, uh, in the, or cross-industry effects uh, between uh, gas and power systems. What I'm going to do now is to close the argument by, by analyzing whether this uh, simplification of networks is necessary or not, or giving a, a frame to analyze the problem. And the theoretical frame for it is that we are dealing here with network industries. Both uh, power and gas sectors are network industries. 
This means that uh, we will have uh, strong economies of scale and scope for network industries, and we will have uh, externalities, both in investment and operation, positive or negative. Um, the bottom line of this is that uh, we should expect uh, we should expect uh, significant needs for vertical integration. In fact, what we know from new institutional economics is that uh, situation like this with uh, uh, economies of scale, externalities, and so on, uh, results in a variety of alternative arrangements uh, because the choice. Uh, uh, between competition and regulation, the, the choice on the level of vertical integration required cannot be defined uh, in advance, ex ante, uh, because it depends on the specific characteristics of the transaction frame. This means, uh, in short, that economic theory doesn't have an answer uh, of the, to the question, which is the correct market design for electricity and gas? It depends on the particular characteristics of the system. So uh, what's the correct level of vertical integration? We don't know. What we do know is that gas and power cannot be based on competition only the rate. We will need some kind of, some level of vertical integration, and this typically results in a scheme generally described by uh, network services organized under common and control, commodity services organized under market arrangement. Of course, the question is uh, how to implement this combination, how to implement the combination of vertical integration and market. And the answer to this is by designing a certain level of free flexibility. Uh, this can be seen more or less intuitively if you identify vertical integration with free flexibility. Uh, vertical integration or common and control decisions are taken outside the market. So all the decisions concerning free flexibility will be associated with those decisions uh, uh, taken outside the market. So the services that are not priced in the market the services associated with free flexibility will be organized under common and control. The rest will be decided by market participants. To show uh, how this uh, decision making uh, is done, let me use first this, this simple scheme where I represented the horizontal axis, uh, the space dimension in the vertical uh, x is the, the time dimension, and I'm representing here a point-to-point -point system with time flexibility. Uh, this is a point, uh, I mean, this is a system where each point of the network has a different price, a potentially different price, but all the trades taking place between T1 and T max have the same price. So in the process of designing the market, I am defining the trading space, and I'm defining it by giving uh, free flexibility from T1 to T max. This is one dimension. I am uh, acting in the time dimension. I could act also in the space dimension. I could also define uh, flexibility for, for the space dimension, uh, as in this second scheme. This would be uh, the speed, the typical scheme followed in, in nodal pricing systems in, in the power market, for example, in PEM. This would be uh, the design strategy followed in power system in the European Union, where uh, power systems are given uh, considerable spatial flexibility to market players. A last option uh, can be the one found in, in European gas system, which is the entry exit, which uh, uh, is based on not giving spatial flexibility to the points uh, of entry in the system, but uh, is giving uh, spatial flexibility to the, to the exit in the system. 
So the main idea of these of these uh, schemes here is that uh, what we are doing uh, in the simplification process is to define in a certain trade-off between vertical integration and market arrangement, which is essentially a step defined by uh, the economic theory. So uh, the bottom line again is that you cannot escape in network industries the definition of some level of free flexibility. So we have a situation where uh, network services are not priced. So as network pricing services are not priced, uh, we will not have tariffs uh, that are called reflective, and we will not have capacity allocated without, um, with players' preferences. Of course, uh, what I'm meaning here is that some of the network services will not be priced according to players' preferences. So uh, we have two dimensions here, tariffs and capacity, long-term and short-term, and two dimensions for uh, the flexibility, time and space. But combining all the possibilities, the uh, essential element we have is that the network cost observed by players will be different from the real cost of the network. So the decisions made by, by market will be defined uh, by the market rules uh, specified in the design of market. So let me, let me end this webinar by uh, showing a couple of examples of, of this flexibility decisions process. Uh, for example, this one is a short-term time flexibility, short time flexibility in capacity allocation, and it represents uh, what we are doing in a, a daily gas balance. We have in the horizontal axis the 24 hours of the day, and we have here uh, in these triangular lines the cumulated differences between uh, injections and withdrawals in the system. The idea uh, of this representation is that uh, we may have a lot of trades uh, within the day, but by, the, by definition, we are imposing that all the trades during this uh, taking place within the day have the same price. So uh, all these imbalances, as long as you are in balance uh, hour 24, will be free and will be managed by the TSO. That is uh, the common and control element. The second example is uh, the spatial flexibility in the long term, uh, spatial flexibility in the, in the tariff definition. We have said that not all network services are priced. So what we have is a situation where tariffs can be cost reflect. Uh, in this uh, simple scheme, with two points where uh, this represents a gas system, with two points where the gas can be injected, and two points here and here where the gas can be withdrawn, uh, it's easy to show that with this simple scheme, it's impossible to calculate uh, tariffs for all these points that are cost reflective of the transportation cost. This means that the only strategy I have left is to guess what is the total consumption, the total withdrawn of gas here. For example, if I assume that all the gas exiting here in XD is coming from an A that is using this transport AD, is uh, doing this path, what I can do is uh, calculate uh, a tariff uh, to represent this cost, the cost of transporting gas from A to D. But in doing so, I am subsidizing the gas uh, going from C to D. This is a, a longer distance trade, and I'm assuming all the gas is exiting here. So uh, this transport is subsidizing the transport from C to D. From an overall system perspective, this is this might be uh, essentially uh, well, or, or maybe not 
very important because most of the gas is exiting here, if uh, my expectations were right. This is not a problem, but from the signal point of view, it's relevant because uh, you have a strong signal, so cheap gas coming from C to D. This can happen between two zones. Uh, in fact, you can have situations where you pay the subsidy twice, for example, in this trade I represent here from A to F. Uh, this A to F trade is paying to subsidies, which is usually called a bank banking effect. And uh, linking this situation with a contractor congestion uh, situation we were talking before, this is another source of possible different price between two zones. We have a uh, barrier to trade from A to B because this transportation uh, cost is higher than it should be. So what we will have in the end is an artificial high price in one of the two zones. Of course, we, have, we can have the, the opposite situation where we are receiving two subsidies, which is sometimes called anti-pancaking. But the bottom line here is that uh, we are creating price differences between zone A and zone B uh, that are uh, directly related with uh, our definition of network rules, our market design. And we saw in the first part uh, what were the consequences of that. So let me conclude quickly with uh, a summary of what we've seen. We began looking at the interaction of, of market designs and what we saw is where we need uh, harmonized market designs because otherwise my, uh, the decision making is affected. And uh, the danger or the potential danger of this situation is not related to the absolute values of uh, the simplification in each network separately because what we've seen are uh, relative effects. Uh, we, are, we were not concerned whether the signal coming from the um, gas market, for example, was relevant when compared to the overall gas system. We were comparing gas and power system. And if there are uh, some asymmetries between the two, uh, there can be a relative signal that is going to be always important. For example, if uh, you have a sustained situation where uh, investing in uh, one zone is slightly cheaper, you are going to have uh, always the incentive to invest in the cheap zone. And uh, we saw that the interaction uh, between the two designs, the need for harmonization, is root in the decision on the trade-off efficiency versus flexibility. This decision, this or this trade-off is usually associated with each industry uh, separately. But we, we've seen uh, that this decision has important cross-industry effects. So we need to take that into account when, when deciding that. And moreover, we need to take in, into account the changes in power or gas production patterns. For example, if we decided three decades ago uh, a particular trade-off, assuming a particular flat pattern of the gas system, but now we have a very volatile gas system, we will probably uh, need to revisit uh, the decision-making process, efficiency versus flexibility. And this has to be done not only in the short term, not only in the, sh in the long term, we need to take to pay attention to the interaction uh, long versus short term decision because they play, as we saw, a critical role. And that was all. Magda, the screen is yours again. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Miguel, for your presentation. And uh, right now, before we'll start the Q&A, I would like to just say that right now on your screen, you can see Miguel's email address. Therefore, if you will have any comments or questions, after the webinar, you can contact him directly. And right now, Miguel, unfortunately, I have to still 
ask you <laughs> a couple of questions. <laughs> I know that it's almost <laughs> 7 a.m. in Rio. Um, <laughs> I'm okay. going to sleep anyway. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, would I would like to say also that our audience can still submit uh, your question because we we have just a couple of them submitted now and and I think you will have still time so some others so uh, please submit your questions right now uh, okay so the first question will be the US gas market is based on long-term contract instead <laughs> of TSOs is your analysis still valid yeah okay US uh, let's go back uh, let me go back to this this situation, for example, here, where we were comparing, we were analyzing uh, decisions uh, on market design here, uh, simplification of the network resulting in uh, modification of gas prices. Well, the idea of, of the US gas system, uh, to put it simply, is that they don't have TSOs. Uh, they don't have a need in the gas system to uh, define uh, rules ex ante. Uh, it's a system based on long-term contracting where private pipelines uh, owners negotiate directly with the uh, pipeline users a contract with uh, not only the capacity but also the simplification of the network we are talking about. So the question is that in the US system, it is true that uh, they are simplifying the network, of course, because it's required. But instead of using, as we, uh, instead of using vertical integration, uh, as we is this trader, they're not using uh, command and control directly. What they are using is uh, long-term bilateral contract. So in this regard, they don't need to introduce simplifications or uh, regulatory defined simplifications in the gas system. So the only source of interaction comes from the regulatory decisions of the power system. They are relevant. I mean, uh, you have the problems we are seeing here. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't remember what state, but uh, recently uh, the regulator of some northeastern state in the U.S. went to declare to the Congress saying that uh, in order to secure the supply of electricity, uh, regul uh, power regulators uh, will have or, or need to have the ability to intervene in the gas market in order to control uh, a secure amount of gas supply. So in this regard, what we would see is a power system decision, for example, certain level of gas storage, intervening in the gas market. And you will see interaction, but uh, the kind of uh, regulatory decisions that we are seeing here will be way less. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. The second question is, how the size of entry exit zones are considered in your analysis? Mm, okay. Thank you. Good question. Let me uh, look for... Okay, here. In the end, we had this situation uh, where we were speaking of a contractual congestion here, uh, creating artificial gas prices and artificial signals. The size of entry exit systems uh, is related to this question. Entry exit systems are based or, or means uh, free spatial flexibility. Uh, we saw uh, in these schemes that um, entry exit systems were giving free spatial flexibility to market players. And we saw that free spatial flexibility can create barriers to to trade between zone, a, zone B to zone A or zone A to zone B. So uh, the higher the entry exit zone, the higher the level of spatial flexibility, free spatial flexibility. So uh, in, in my framework, the size or the effects of the size of the entry exit system would be considered here, uh, where uh, the 
signals coming from the free spatial flexibility are considered. For example, what we will have uh, entry exit with the higher the entry exit zone is, uh, the more possible is this kind of situation where the artificial signal from the gas market is destroying the real signal from the power market. Thanks again. Okay, thank you, Miguel. Uh, the next question from our audience. Can the internal energy market be effectively finalized and working across the European Union if this market design approach is not levelized throughout the entire European Union? Well, I, uh, um, depending on the definition of uh, implementation, what is uh, for sure is that uh, the internal, the resulting European market is not going to be efficient, it's going to have a, a very um, distorted signals, ending up with uh, probably mis uh, misguided decisions. And, and the set of decisions affected by that is huge. I mean, we were um, describing here the situation with gas turbines, but uh, consider that uh, this is affecting also the networks. The choice between building power networks or gas networks, the choice between building LNG terminals or uh, gas pipelines, because many of the differences are coming from the relative flexibility that, that you need in one market or the other. And on top of that, you have uh, localization signals. You have you may have lots of investment in one country with the needs of uh, building power and gas networks uh, related to that, uh, coming simply from a not harmonized market design. So, in my view, the answer is no. Uh, the answer is that uh, the internal European market needs to harmonize design. Okay, thank you, Miguel. I think that we have time still for one or two questions. We'll see how it goes after this one. Uh, so here it is. What if you introduce electricity storage, for instance, hydro now and batteries in the future? Would your frame change? Again, the the uh, I I heard I heard batteries, but not the first one. Okay, uh, yeah. So once again, what if you introduce electricity storage, like hydro right now and batteries in the future? Does your frame change oh, okay. in this case? Uh, uh, the frame it doesn't change. I mean, is is uh, electricity storage is a source of flexibility. So what we need to decide is whether we can uh, allocate this flexibility through markets or we need uh, to, to arrange or organize this flexibility under common and control um, schemes, uh, which is uh, the discussion uh, we were having before. Uh, so in the end, the question, well, the first question is a technical one. Is it possible uh, to allocate electricity storage through markets? Uh, in my view, it's relatively easy to allocate uh, hydropower through markets, or at least in some systems, not always. I mean, Brazil, in fact, uh, which is a perfect example of a system where allocating hydropower through market is especially difficult. Uh, batteries maybe are not so easy to allocate to markets, but uh, you can create schemes uh, to do that. But in any case, if you are providing uh, free flexibility, if you are deciding to organize electricity storage and the common and control, you need to look at the gas system as well. Uh, the point of this webinar is that uh, it's not adequate only to look at the power system. You need also to consider that uh, giving free flexibility in the power system is an effective signal for, for the gas system. For example, for the localization of gas turbines, for the building signals of the networks, uh, choices between power and gas networks, etc. 
So no, the, the answer is the frame won't be changed in my view. Okay, uh, thank you, Miguel. I think we have just a couple of minutes still to and to ask the last question. But pre please, Miguel, uh, I would ask you to be very brief in your answer. Uh, so the question is: so yes what, or no question? Uh, yeah, well, not really, but uh, almost. <laughs> um, what's the impact of congestion management tools? Uh, congestion management tools are uh, intended to solve this problem. Uh, congestion management tools are uh, increasing the efficiency of uh, cross-border allocation. So uh, they are reducing the presence of contractor congestion. So uh, this situation we were describing here, the creation of artificial gas prices creating artificial signals, uh, is at least alleviated by, by the presence of effective congestion management tools. Brief enough? Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much, Miguel. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, Miguel, so now it's time to say goodbye. You can have your breakfast, and in Europe, we'll start to preparing for lunch. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that you were with Thank us you. today. Thank you. And, Thank you, uh, and goodbye, all.